You're listening to the Swap Society Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole Robertson. I interview thought leaders and change makers who are working to create a more sustainable and equitable world through fashion, art, and activism. Join us for a dose of climate optimism as we envision a brighter future. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Swap Society podcast. Today, I'm talking with Nayantara Banerjee, who works for the Los Angeles Garment Workers Center in industry research and strategic partnerships. Prior to working with GWC, she was the founder of the Williamsburg Seamster, a high-end alterations and sewing studio that specialized in custom bridal gowns. Hello, Nayantara. Thank you for being on the show. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So where are you talking to us from today and where are you from originally? Uh, well, I'm talking to you from my home here on Tongva land or in Los Angeles, um, not too far from downtown. Um, and I've, I've been here in LA for about almost six years. Um, I, before that I moved around a lot. So I was born in India and I then, uh, kind of grew up in little parts of like the Northeast Pennsylvania, Delaware. And I, uh, spent the most of my time in New York before moving to LA. Very cool. So please tell us about your journey from <laughs> seamstress to labor rights activist. Oh, thank you for asking about that. It's something that I've been reflecting on a lot more recently. Um, but, you know, I, my background, I started um, sewing from a very young age. There are photos of me, like literally naked as a child by a sewing machine. Um, you know, just like, what is this? I really was interested. <laughs> my high school offered a class called wardrobe, uh, which I was able to take like one and two and then independent study. So I, I mean, I got high school credit for making my prom dress. Um, yeah. and yeah, I, I mean, just like a public high school in Wilmington, Delaware, who knew, but, um, but you know, I really liked the craft of, of garment making, um, and sewing and so I went to college at Syracuse. I studied fashion design at the time when, you know, there was no talk about sustainability or ethics whatsoever. Um, and um, shortly after graduating, moved to New York and I started working in the fashion industry and always felt a little out of place and felt a little challenged by what I was seeing as exploitation um, at many levels. You know, I, I was a production manager for a brand that was made in New York. And I, I kind of just like saw that the, um, discrepancy between how much garment workers were paid and how much the garments were sold for, for example. Um, and then I also saw the way that um, folks were mistreating each other throughout the supply chain, including up within, like within the corporate side of the fashion industry, or more of like the designers and you know behind the scenes on that side, and how those um, practices and, and, and kind of like ways of, of, of interacting with people get passed on down, the, down the supply chain. And so I started my own business, the Williamsburg Seamster first as a way to, um, uh, you know, use my skills in sewing and, and to help to fix garments that already existed as a way to prevent things from going to a landfill, tailoring garments, um, you know, re recreating vintage garments. Um, and then I transitioned into bridal so that it would actually allow me to go to grad school where I studied labor rights in the garment industry. And then I learned about the Garment Worker Center and my research. I was uh, really actively um, researching Bangladesh at the time. I started grad school the year of the Rana Plaza collapse. And I got to go to Bangladesh and really witness this, the impact of this kind of tragedy and speak to people who are directly impacted um, and speak to factory owners and garment workers and really just see how, um, you know, how this industry operates and how it was impacting people. And I came back feeling like I really wanted, you know, to, to make a change or to work towards change look domestically, because as I was learning from, you know, GWC, this is happening also here. So I, I moved to LA, I reached out to GWC to become a volunteer and, um, you know, like within months of moving here. And I, um, I was a volunteer for GWC for about three years. Um, I started volunteering. I mean, I, I started as a volunteer in a creative Espacio Creativo teaching um, members who are very skilled um, at garment production, but teaching them new things that they wanted to learn. So design, um, you know, we'd make mood boards and then pattern making and, you know, some more advanced skills that they're not given the opportunity to learn when they're sewing um, assembly line garment production. Um, and then also some other members who are 
um, you know, for example, trimmers, their whole, you know, we had one member whose entire job is just trimming garments as they come off the assembly line and she was never given the opportunity to even operate a sewing machine. And so, um, you know, I facilitated a course where we, you know, we together, like other garment workers also are, are teaching one another how to do these things. And, and then this member um, who was a trimmer, you know, she, um, she has just developed into such a leader at the organization. It helped to un um, empower her in her own skills, her own abilities. Um, and, um, and for me, that was just really powerful. And I felt, wow, like this is a really remarkable organization. Um, and I started working for GWC in the beginning of 2020. 2020 uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, to help grow industry support for our legislation SB 62, which I know we'll, we'll talk, touch on. And then it grew into a full-time job. Very cool. You know, you were talking about training for the, you know, the different types of garment manufacturing, different types of, you know, finishing and sewing. And for, for people that are tuning in and they maybe don't know that much about what goes into the making of a garment, how many steps on average are there for say, you know, even just something as simple as a shirt, like I'm wearing this Oxford shirt, how many people does it take to make something like this typically? Um, well, don't quote me on where this came from, but I, the number I hear is that 35 hands have touched every garment on average, right? Um, and, and just to give a sense of where that's all happening, right? From, from the fiber to, um, to, you know, you having a garment sold in a store, um, you'll have the creation of the, you know, of the fiber into fabric, the fabric gets, um, you know, shipped and then cut into the pattern shapes and then the a garment is assembled and it may be assembled by one person who does the whole thing down, you know, like assembly, putting on the sleeves together, sewing the hem, sewing on every button, making every buttonhole. But more often than not, those things are uh, separated into different tasks and operations. So uh, that's where you get, you know, maybe 35 people um, making that garment. And from my perspective, I feel like garment workers are very skilled workers. And I don't get the impression that most people have that perspective or, or really have an understanding of how much training and experience goes into the making of our clothes. And as someone who has been at the sewing machine yourself and also working with garment workers, what would you say to people that that maybe have this kind of this different perspective or maybe this lack of understanding of that it really is skilled labor. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I think the devaluation of garment worker, garment work in general, and therefore garment workers now is, it's a long history, very tied to um, the slavery in the U S uh, you know, in terms of cotton production and how we, how we see labor that is involved in making soft goods, right, um, are often, you know, what would what one might call women's work or pink collar work, where it's really people of the queer community, uh, femme, women, and people of color, right, minorities. So th we live in a society that just devalues these people to begin with, right? And so when you're looking at the garment workforce, which um, in Los Angeles and around the world is predominantly um, uh, made up of women, made up of, Im uh, of people of color. In America, it's largely made up of immigrants. Um, it makes sense that this work is, um, is, is uh, not seen, right? Um, but I, I'll just say, right, as, as someone who made my living sewing um, for the first uh, 13 years of my, of my career, uh, that I have, the, I could not do what a garment worker, what a member at GWC does on a daily basis. Um, not only is the work itself, you have, to, you know, you, you're, you're taking flat garment, flat things, right? Flat fabric and making it into a 3D product, right? That has armholes, everything, you know, everything has to work. You have to have an understanding of how all of that goes together. And then you have to be able to operate a very, difficult to operate machine. Um, you know, uh, when you're, when you're sewing on an industrial sewing machine, the speed at which the machine goes, if you, I mean, what you would do is be pressing on a pedal, 
almost like if you're um, accelerating in your car, right? Mm -hmm. um, but imagine getting into a car that like, if you press on the pedal just the slightest bit, it's off, right? <laughs> like you have to have incredible control and be manipulating the fabric with the needle, minding your fingers, minding the, the material you're working on because the material is you know, so precisely cut you don't, you can't just start all over. If you mess something up, you can take, remove seams for, you know, but certain materials will still show stitching holes. Um, so if, so I would, you know, I just wish everyone could have to make a garment, right? I think we kind of had that, I think in like home ec and things like everyone maybe made a pillow, maybe made an apron or something. Right. But if you really have to think about how to make a garment, you would have such a better understanding. And another way that folks, if, we're, if they're really curious, it's just to take apart a garment. If you get, you know, if you have like a vintage garment or some kind of that you might be getting, you know, you can get a seam ripper, you can even just kind of cut it and see, you know, all the, all the different pieces and then have to kind of figure out how do you put this back together? Um, you know, that's something that you can do just, I, I think to help to, to connect a little bit more um, to this. And we all wear clothes and we're all gonna need to wear clothes for the foreseeable future. Um, I mean, it's gonna get pretty hot, but I think we'll still wanna wear clothes. Um, I, I, I think that we have, like, we just have no time. We have got to um, make sure that this is dignified work for the millions of people around the world who are keeping us um, safe in our garments. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I think that that is just really helpful information to have. And, you know, confession, I actually do not know how to use a sewing machine. I, I feel like at some point I'd love to learn. I think it would be really cool to, yeah. to experience, but it seems a little overwhelming to me. I think that the notion of having to follow a pattern or it seems like there's a lot of mathematics involved and things have to be really specific, especially if, you know, you're making, you know, you're mass producing garments and you're creating all of these different sizes and, you know, it, it, it should be dignified work. I have so much appreciation for people that do that work and that are skilled at it. I think it really is, um, you know, or even just watching some of those fashion shows, right? Right, <laughs> you right, see, right. It's not easy. Not everybody can sew well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even people that have gone to fashion school or what have you. So mm -hmm. I think that just kind of really appreciating the work that goes behind the, the items that we accumulate in our lives can just give us so much more compassion for, for the people that do that work. So you did mention SB 62 and obviously I want to talk about that. Um, so the Garment Worker Protection Act, also known as SB 62 here in California, was really a major inflection point for the fashion industry. What did SB 62 change and how has its passing impacted the lives of garment workers here in California? Um, well, thank you for asking, Nicole, and thank you for endorsing, right? Um, <laughs> I want to just name that Swap Society was one of uh, 158 endorsers that we had for this legislation just from the industry we also mm -hmm. had a, uh, quite a number of endorsers from other organizations and and community groups um but um you know sb62 um really grew out of the 20 years of advocacy and organizing that garment workers have been doing um in los angeles you know we passed it also in gwc's 20th year um and so it uh you know but the the bill itself, um, the law as it is now actually, eliminates the use of the piece rate system of pay, which has been used for um, for too long uh, to um, make it so that garment workers are earning their wages pennies at a time, earning um, you know a few cents per shoulder seam, you know a few cents per hem, and at the end of the day, averaging anywhere from like you know three to six dollars an hour. Um, and this resulted in a lot of wage theft. Uh, you know, wage theft is uh, when you're not paid fully for your time working. And so garment workers not only um, were, uh, init you know, with the original bill um, that was passed in 1999, the original Garment Worker Protection Act, it, um, you know, said that garment workers have to be paid the minimum wage, you still allowed piece rate, but if you were not meeting minimum wage by the piece rate, 
the employer is supposed to make up the difference. So mm. let's say you are only earning $6 an hour. Well, then the employer is supposed to make that difference up so that you can hit minimum wage. But that still puts minimum wage as the ceiling to what, gar what garment workers can earn. Um, and SE62 flips that now so that minimum wage is the floor and still allows for incentives for productivity above the minimum wage so that if you're, you know, really fast, if, you know, if you can do a lot, then you, you can be incentivized um, in that way. And this came from what garment workers identified as the main, um, main way that their wages were being stolen, right? Um, but the, the biggest thing about SB62 is that established brand accountability for wages. Um, and, and that means, for example, when many of our workers um, you know, few, several years before uh, we launched this legislative campaign, we're producing for Ross. And um, the labor commissioner uh, the, of the state of California had, um, you know, heard their cases for wage theft where, and, uh, where garment workers, I think there was about five of them, had come together with a, a claim of eight, over $800,000 in stolen wages that they were owed producing at factories that produced garments solely for Ross. But Ross was able to say, we are not accountable because we are not um, explicitly defined as a brand guarantor in the law. Um, and so th that was one of kind of the loopholes that a number of bad actors in Los Angeles, like Forever 21, Fashion Nova, Charlotte Russe, um, you know, these fast fashion um, brands were, were using to avoid accountability. And so garment workers were owed $800,000, but there was no one there to pay it. Uh, and so SB 62 clarified and, and strengthened the language in the law to say brands are accountable for the wages in their supply chain because they in fact create the conditions and provide the, the manufacturers, the contractors, and subcontractors, the resources that then translate into what the workers are paid. Um, and that's something I think for folks who, you know, even if you're not super familiar with the industry, you know how this works, right? But if you have a brand um, there that wants to produce however many, you know, of a number of garments, they're not the ones producing it themselves, right? They're going to go through a manufacturer or a contractor and a contractor would mean a factory, right? That's really what we have here. Um, and um, and they dictate exactly how many of the item, what color, what sizes, what fabric, down to you know the down to the thread, right, down to every little last piece. Um, and they also dictate the price they're going to pay per garment, and that price is not factoring in their living wage for workers. And it's built off of this piece rate system. It's built off of a system, you know, of a of way of doing things that is archaic. Um, and so what SB 62 does, and now, you know, what, um, you know, a further legislation is also attempting to do is to say, you are accountable for those wages if that, you know, if you have been, if there's been an investigation, there will always be an investigation, right, to find who's accountable. So if it was the factory, the subcontractor, that, you know, contracts can show they had been paid enough to comply with minimum wage and they just did it, well, then they're, they're held accountable, right? But if it can go up the supply chain to hold the brands at the top accountable and make sure that garment workers are made whole. That's so great. And I'm, and you work so closely with the garment workers here in LA. I, I'm assuming because it's been a few months now that this has been in play, that it's had a really positive impact for a lot of these these people, mostly women, making our clothes here in Los Angeles. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a new legislation still, right? So if, with any legislation like this, we want to give it some time to settle in and kind of and see how it's shaking out. And uh, our main focus has been on ensuring that the law is being enforced. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes through a couple of things of educating workers on their rights. So make, making sure that they use the tools that they have to file when they're uh, rights are violated. And then to ensure that contractors, subcontractors, and brands are also aware of their new obligations under the law. And so um, that's the, the main focus right now. And we're still collecting that information, you know, but from what we have, you know, we've heard from, from members um, as of, you know, January 1st, their incomes double, right? They're, they're, that, that's a huge, 
huge deal, um, you know, to, to go from earning $6 an hour to, you know, in Los Angeles, it'll be a minimum wage around $15 an hour. Um, and, and that makes a big impact on the local economy, the local community, right? These are, um, often, you know, mothers, you know, children who are in school who need a lot of, you know, a lot of, you need a lot of things when you, when you're a kid here. So I think we're starting to see that from our members that, that, it, you know, the longer term, you know, like it, not only are you making one paycheck that was twice as much, but now you continue to make that paycheck. And what are the other improvements in your life and in your health um, that, that come with that? And I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, as the industry researcher, as a researcher at, at GOVC, to kind of um, go back and like uh, compare things that we've collected, you know, information we've collected from our membership over the last couple of years, especially through the pandemic when government workers were deeply impacted by this as well and into the next few years to see what, um, you know, what um, ways that it's changed their lives. That's so great. And now Senator Gillibrand has introduced the Fabric Act, and I definitely want to talk about that. This would afford similar protections to garment workers across the United States, not just in California. Um, is it fair to say that the passing of this would, um, is it more of an expansion of SB 62? Uh, how are they different? How, how does the Fabric Act differ from SB 62? Or is it really just kind of taking it on and, and spreading it across the country? Yeah. Um, well, so, you know, GWC has been an early collaborator with Senator Gillibrand's office on this legislation. In fact, our, our director, Marissa, met with um, the senator while we were still in the SB 62 campaign, right? So she was some, this is something she was thinking about as a Senator from New York. Um, um, we, um, you know, helped to craft the language since it, they really did want, you know, take a lot of inspiration from, from SB 62. But SB 62 is very specific to California labor law, right? And the federal bill can only update federal labor law. So mm -hmm. it, we're up, it updates the Federal Labor Standard, Standards okay. Act, which is what gives us a lot of our, you know, protections and the guidance that um, companies use when, you know, talking about all different kinds of workers in America, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the way this um, uh, Fabric Act will do it is like amending the Fair Labor Standards Act or the FLSA um, to create these like really pretty historic worker protections that level the playing field for responsible garment production. And so that includes like SB 62, setting the minimum wage as the floor um, to eliminate the piece, uh, the piece rate system. Um, and it also allowing incentives on top of that. Um, and, and there is a carve out. So if you're a worker that's already a part of a unionized shop, that's already been, um, you know, that you've negotiated a pay rate that is appropriate, you know, for you and your colleagues, then you're also exempt from that. Um, but it also includes brand liability, again, from SB 62, which we need, because if we only increase the minimum wage floor, and we don't have brand liability, all of the burden of complying with minimum wage falls on the factories, um, the manufacturers who are often, you know, small businesses themselves. A lot of them are mom and pop in Los Angeles. A lot of them are former garment workers who've just opened their own mm. um, factory. Right. And when they're not being paid enough by the brands, um, if they're held accountable for wage theft and they're not paid enough, they don't really have the resources to pay the workers, which is why we have unpaid workers. But then, they, you know, they don't they can't even stay in business. Right. Mm. So. So it's really important that the brand accountability is part of it to really encourage brands to be partners with their suppliers, right? It's, it's a partnership. Um, and it also builds on SB 62 um, by providing more things to incentivize domestic manufacturing. Um, so that includes a 30% reshoring tax credit for companies that bring production back to the United States. Um, and it establishes a $40 million domestic garment manufacturing support program, which is really awesome because it's going to help, you know, it's going to supply grants that help manufacturers cover equipment costs and safety improvements and training. And, and it can also support um, nonprofits who are going to provide training and workforce development in this sector. So things that we really need for the workforce to 
um, to evolve and be strong uh, and to take advantage of the nearshoring trends that have been growing since the pandemic um, and all the supply chain disruptions that that brought. Um, the last thing I'll add that that the bill does is that it also establishes a nationwide garment manufacturing registry, which is going to help increase transparency. I mean, by so much in California right now, garment manufacturers all have to register with the state. Um, and that's a, that's through, again, it's, a, it's also through, you know, kind of the same offices, um, organization agencies rather that we work with in enforcing the bill, but that registration piece is, is, is really key because right now there is no central place where you can go to find who are all the manufacturers and factories in, in America. Um, and so it makes it, difficult when you're looking to, um, you know, to strengthen an industry, you have to know what's there, right? You have mm -hmm. to really understand it. So. Very cool. What are the biggest challenges to getting this legislation passed and what's the timeline? Um, well, right. You know, the bill was just introduced a couple of weeks ago and it's, um, a very different process from, from, you know, what uh, what we do, what we just did in SB sixty two in, in the sense it's probably a longer timeline. Um, right now, the focus is on really making sure that we're getting all the co sponsors right. So the bill was introduced by Senator Gillibrand, and we all already um, have co sponsors from the senators from Vermont, Bernie Sanders. Senator Warren from Massachusetts, and Senator Booker from New Jersey. So we've got some great great. Um, supporters there, and we and um, we should soon be hearing right from the senators from California, and then you know making sure that it has a really strong um, support in the Senate, and then the and then it will also you know continue to um, get um, a support in the House, right? So that when the bill does move out to the, out of the Senate, but it's at this time you know we're really trying to just grow that support. And um, I can't say what the longer timeline is, um, only because this is also an election year. <laughs> so the Senate process, you know, like the federal government and the, the folks in office have a very different um, uh, structure when it's an election year, what the, you know, things just sort of go on pause. So I think that, you know, Senator Gillibrand's office is, is a really great um, um resource for us to like kind of learn more about this process and we're in, in in we're in this with a number of our allies and partners which is really great you know remake and fashion revolution we've been regularly meeting with um and unions uh, retail workers distribution service mm. RWDSU, I'll say that, um, RWDSU and a few other, and uh, Workers United, and you know, there's a lot of other folks in it. So it's, it's nice to be again in like coalition with a lot of people um, to get this passed. How can people share their support for the Fabric Act? Um, it's great for folks to visit fabricact.org and you can um, call your Senator if they haven't already um, sponsored the bill. You can easily uh, pull up a number and script to call them there. Um, and you can share about it on social media, hashtag Fabric Act, um, and there's social media assets that you can share there. Um, and, and if you have a brand, a fashion brand, a business, um, if you have a nonprofit, you know, an organization that also, you know, that you'd like to, to be involved, you can endorse the legislation. You can also visit fabricact.org to learn more about how to do that. Um, or folks can email me and I can put you in touch with the Senator staff to submit your endorsement. Um, but we really want to show that this is industry. This is something the industry wants, right? This is the industry uh, came together to support worker led legislation for SB 62 in a way that was unprecedented. Um, and, and again, we're seeing, I think we already have about 80 endorsers for the Fabric Act. Um, and so when we come together like this, we, we, we know that we were success. We can be successful with, as we were with SB 62. So we really want to encourage more folks to sign on and to, um, encourage, um, you know, this industry, you know, help to push this industry to where it needs to be. And how does the Fashion Act in New York fit into all of this in this recent wave of legislation that's working to try to improve the fashion industry? Um, well, you know, as I said, this is uh, 
a, there's a, a recent wave, right? There's like this sort of new suite of policy that's coming forward and each focuses on, you know, in different areas and different jurisdictions, right? The New York Fashion Act will, will be uh, it, in New York only. The federal, what's really great about the, the Fabric Act is that it levels the playing field domestically um, across the nation. So you won't have pockets of, you know, ethical garment manufacturing here and there, and therefore competition between the states, um, but a more level playing field where, um, you know, everyone is kind of held at least to that same bare minimum federal standard. Um, and then, you know, for example, the, the states, um, uh, the, where, where, where protections are stronger in the state, those protections will be held like over the federal, let, uh, federal protections, just like yeah. we have in California, minimum wage that is much higher than federal minimum wage. So you have to be paying that one. Yeah. Got it. Very cool. And mm -hmm. <laughs> what I love a good fashion love story before we wrap up, um, mm -hmm. what's your favorite piece in your closet and why? Um, well, this is a, I, I was thinking about this question. Um, and I, I was not sure what I would say because I just haven't really thought about that. And I really appreciate it though. It's just been the pandemic has really changed, you know, like getting dressed even, right. Like, mm -hmm. um, and so what it is, is a, um, it's a big moo moo. It's a big moo moo. Um, if I'm, it, I actually have it. Do you want to see oh, it? Oh yeah, I, I, I want to describe. It. I pulled oh, it out because I was just like, I want to just like, it's this green Ooh. striped. It's a green, like very trippy striped moo moo. It has a zipper and it has a big peacock on it. Love it. And the reason I love, first of all, it has pockets. Um, and very it important. unzips, so it's a moo moo, but it has a little something. Um, <laughs> and um, but it's it actually came from um, um a few years ago. I hosted a community yard sale. Um, meaning I collected, you know, garments and things from all folks all across the community and all the proceeds of the yard sale went to the garment worker center. And I, um, you know, I was really, for, I, it was just, my house was full of bags of clothing. Cause I told a few for everyone was like, I've got stuff. I've got stuff. And this actually was, came from a friend, uh, you know, I, I, I purchased it at my own, at the yard sale. Um, and it, uh, you know, from a friend here. And then she told me that she got it from her friend who happened to be someone I worked at a restaurant with years ago in wow. Brooklyn who gave it to her. And so I just love this like small world of it. And then it was something that I, that came out of, um, a very cool thing, you know, cool way to raise funds for garment workers. I love that. Obviously, I'm a big fan of secondhand yes. and sharing yeah. clothes with other people. And that's such a fun story. And what a fun print. And I am definitely feeling the Moo Moo vibe these days. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to embrace it because, it, I mean, it just feels so good when you're really... Um, you know, letting loose in one. Yeah. Especially in the <laughs> summer. It's almost summer. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it should be a moo moo summer. <laughs> Hot moo moo summer. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so what's inspiring you right now? Where are you getting your inspiration from these days? Um, well, I, I, I don't mean to be um, cheesy, but I'm, I'm, I'm inspired every single day by our members, the government workers, uh, the government worker center, you know, one other thing that I just will name briefly that we're working on, um, at GWC and, and you'll hear more about this from us soon is, a, a land use and rezoning campaign. The city is planning, uh, changes to land use in the fashion district where the garment industry has had a home in Los Angeles for over 130 years. Um, and these changes are going to prohibit garment manufacturing in a lot of places where garment workers, um, and, and business owners have been operating for decades, right? Um, and so we have been organizing with um, with our members and with businesses um, to communicate to the city planning department and the city council members who will be ultimately making a decision on the rezoning plan um, about this industry, about how much how valuable it is, about um, you know how uh, remarkable this moment is for this industry with the near shoring coming back with the level playing field from SB 62 and particularly in uh, Los Angeles, this really strong worker. And now the federal bill, which is also trying to incentivize garment, you know, is, is going to be incentivizing domestic garment manufacturing and our members 
um, you know, as we've been talking to them about this, not only are they helping us, uh, you know, think strategically about what, uh, what is it going to be our priority and, and, you know, what are the areas where we need to focus and, um, but they're also really, they really understand what's at stake here. They really understand just as they did with SB 62, their role in changing this industry. And so I'm really excited to see a really like specific Los Angeles garment manufacturing and worker justice centered ecosystem here. Folks who may follow GWC or if you haven't yet, I highly recommend, you know, you can, you'll, you'll see some of our members in, in, our, in our actions and press conferences and things like that. Um, and they, they are not only the experts on garment making, but they're the experts on what this industry needs. And so I'm just really excited to be able to turn to them and learn from them um, when they are also working 60 hour work weeks, right? And they're getting paid such short, they make the time to go to committee meetings. They make the time to come, you know, this time I wasn't able to confirm a member to join the podcast. Usually I love to have a member, um, but you know, you know, to, to do a lot. Some of our members are teaching themselves English so that they can better speak to media. Can you imagine teaching yourself a language and then going straight to media to speak about it? You know, I mean, that's like, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And so I, I'm just really, I feel very fortunate um, to be able to work in support of, of these leaders. And we'll have you back. I would love to have some, yeah. of, the, of uh, you know, some of those workers here. I think that would be really exciting to meet with it them and talk great. with them. Yeah. Um, what's making you feel optimistic about the future? It sounds like the garment workers are also inspiring you, but if maybe there's something else, it's such a crazy time. <laughs> It's a crazy, it's a crazy time. Uh, it certainly is, but I'm feeling, you know, I think just finding community in all the ways. I feel uh, honestly like there's been a lot more community through Zoom in the last couple of years, and I'm just trying to embrace that wherever possible because I, that's what it takes. We have to get out of our houses. Maybe we start on Zoom to get the conversation going, but then we get out and we get together with people and we start to change and break down the things that aren't working and and build new things. So Nayantara, how can people find you and Garment Workers Center? Um, well, you can find Garment Workers Center. You can find our website, garmentworkerscenter.org. Um, and you can find us on Instagram at Garment Worker Center. Uh, and we're also on Twitter, Garment Worker LA. Um, or if you just type in Garment Worker Center, you'll find us. We are the only Garment Worker Center in the United States. Uh, so you should be easily able to, to connect with us. And we would love to, um, you know, I personally, right, would love to hear from folks if folks have further questions, um, ideas for collaborating um, or, uh, you know, working together in some way. We're really open to that um, and really, uh, really just want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to lift up the voice and amplify the voice of garment workers here in California. Thank you so much. The work that you are all doing is so important. And I'm really grateful that you spent the time to talk with us today and explain so much about what's going on in the world of garment worker legislation. And I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nicole. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Swap Society podcast. Swap Society is an online clothing swap for women and kids that makes it easy and affordable to mix up your wardrobe sustainably. We're a growing community of women across the USA who are creating positive change by swapping our clothes and slowing down our fashion consumption. We would love to swap with you. If you're interested in joining, you can sign up at our website. Learn more at www.swapsociety.co. That's swapsociety.co. You can find the show notes for each episode on our website. Please get in touch with us on social media too. We're on Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and YouTube for the video version of this podcast at Swap Society. Music is by Joel Korlitz and yours truly. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Please help us spread the word by subscribing, leaving a rating and review, sharing on social media, or simply telling a friend. We really appreciate your support. Have a wonderful day, and remember to swap before you shop.